So we are uh, at the tail end of a series where we've been talking about different aspects of the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to be talking about living by uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, the New International Version in Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, it says, Let us keep in step with the Spirit. And what you just saw is a phenomenal example of what it means to keep in step, to, to walk in unison. But in this case, it's not with your other military buddies, but it's with uh, God himself. It's with the Holy Spirit in us. And so we're just going to spend some time today to just kind of look at what does that mean for you and I. And we'll, we'll start as we usually do in God's Word if you have a Bible, you can turn to Romans chapter 8. Again, the passage is both in your, in your handout and will come up on the screen. Romans chapter 8. The first four verses read as such. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So I just want to I want to take this apart just just really really quickly for you. He starts out with a phenomenal phenomenal sentence. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Jesus. That's incredible. That is incredible because we all, every single one of us, including myself, carry around the weight of condemnation. Our own conscience reminds us that we don't even live up to our own standards. The outside uh, world's notice and often point out the inconsistencies that we say that we're a Christian, but we do something else. There's always but I say the enemy always brings up old tapes of, the, of past memories of, of what we did in, in our youth, or maybe not so young. There's personal dysfunctions that, that um, like shame and low self-esteem or compulsions that continually trip us up. And every time we, we draw, maybe we, when you come to church or you, or you read your Bible and we draw near to God's perfect law, we're reminded how imperfect we are, and of course, there's Christ's example that reminds us how fall short we are. And there's unhealthy comparisons even among us with other believers that makes us feel inadequate. All these make, have a tendency for us to feel condemnation. But in essence, Paul starts out saying, based on the, on the fact of Christ, which we just sang about, what he did for us, basically he says, we are good with God. There is no condemnation. And then he says, why? He says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So if you're condemned, it means you did not meet the standard. That's the whole idea. You can, you can only be condemned if someone says, this is the standard, either, either uh, the standard that the law set, the human law set, in this case, the standard that God set, or it could be your own standard. The truth is, whatever the measurement is, you came up short, and so you're condemned. But, but what he's saying here is that we no longer live by the law. The law is this, is this rules. It's the, it's the standard of, of the Ten Commandments. It's the standard that Christ lived by and lived perfectly by. We fall short of that. But he says the standard has changed. We now live by the law of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The new law of the Spirit says that only by living in union with Christ can believers break the power of sin in our lives. See, Jesus accomplished it. We're going to talk about that here coming up. But it's the Spirit of God who provides victory, and the Spirit is in possession of every true child of God, and there's a new standard. It's a standard of the Spirit. And he begins to explain this. He said, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Basically, God did what we could not do ourselves. Because, and I don't need to preach about this, the flesh is weak. You don't have to be a Christian to go, duh. You just have to actually just watch the news for five minutes. 
or less. Or take two innocent two-year-olds and put a piece of candy between them. You'll see human nature. And, what, and if there's anything, if there's anything in, in the United States history, and actually the history of the world, but let's just pick on the U.S., this is what we know. You could pass a law against something, it doesn't change people. Have, if we've learned anything, haven't we learned that? So, so God had to do what the law could not ac- accomplish because the law can show you what you should do, but what the law can't do is motivate you to do it other than maybe make you fearful of condemnation. But obviously, as, we've, as we learn and watch human nation, that's not enough. And then he explains this. He says by sending, he, that God accomplished this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other, in other words, Christ took on flesh. He took on, on a nature, kind of like Adam and Eve before the fall, that could be tempted, but he didn't fall to temptation. And therefore, it says he condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, he conquered it. He didn't give in to it. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now, listen, the righteous requirement of the law is is holiness. It's perfection. But Christ met that goal. Christ met that goal. And the Holy Spirit in us, therefore... The representation of God in us meets that goal. And that's why we're not condemned, not because we all of a sudden got it together, but because he had it together. And his righteousness and the fact that he met the standard is given, imputed to us. And the Holy Spirit then provides the power to internally to help us do what the law required of us externally. In other words, the law, excuse me, couldn't provide motivation, but the Holy Spirit does and can. And then he gives us the qualifier. Who does this apply to? Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In other words, this no condemnation that comes through Christ applies to those who follow Jesus, who no longer uh, walk according to the cravings of what makes them happy. It's just another word for follow the flesh. But rather they walk according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, what Paul does here is he then begins to compare and contrast what it means to live according to the flesh versus living according to the Spirit. I'm going to read this passage. It might get a little sticky, but don't worry. I'm going to unstick it for you. All right? But I, just, I want you to hear the Word of God first, and then we'll kind, of, we'll kind of show you really clearly how this goes out. Starting in verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace, specifically with God. For the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, you've been baptized, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, to Christ. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12, So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. Now, like I said, there's a, what he basically do is he's comparing living according to the flesh with living according to the Spirit. 
And I, and I simply want to kind of walk through now that comparison. This, by the way, is in your notes, so you don't have to frantically try to write it all down. It's in the notes for you. Living according to flesh versus living according to the Spirit. The first thing he says is those who live according to flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, which is death. And what it means is they set their minds on what feels good. That's the nature of the flesh. What feel, what, what's going to make me happy in the moment? It sounds good, doesn't it? The problem is, as I can tell you, my doctor can tell you, when I eat why what feels good in the moment, I'm killing myself. And that, by the way, is true with everything. Everything. Your job, sexuality, media, books, you name it. You just, if you consume what just kind of, oh, wow, this, make, this really is fulfilling, it kills you. It absolutely kills you. But those who live according to the Spirit, it says, set their minds on things of the Spirit, which brings life and peace. Specifically, life, it brings eternal life. It brings also a, a, another richness to life that, that is so discovered beyond the self. My wife and I are, are, are interested by these new shows that are popping up on the networks that, are, that seem very spiritual, very friendly to God. The problem is, is that they're combining the two. And there, there's this, you can live for yourself, just do some good. It's, kind of, it's, it's, the, it's the American religious buffet, right? You say, God, lay it all out for me and I'll tell you what I want, right? And then we eat all the dessert and a little bit of the neat meat and no vegetables. And it's like, God, okay, I, we get it. We get that life is meaningless without serving. And so in all these spiritual shows, that's what, it, it, that's what spirituality is, is, comes down to. It's serving others and God showing up to help them in their life. Meanwhile, you can do anything with anyone that you want. Doesn't, doesn't matter how you live your life. As long as it's happy, as long as the end of your life is serving... Uh, what brings true life and peace with God is exclusively living by the Spirit. He says, those who live according to flesh are hostile to God. They do not submit to God's law. Why don't they submit to God's law? Because God's law tells them not to do some things they want to do. And by the way, when I say they, I really mean me. But it's safer to say they. This is, this is my nature too. The nature of my flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, what? They submit to God's law. Not only do they submit, they look for it. That's the next one, right? Those who live according to flesh, it says they can't even please God. Yeah, but they do some good. Ah, that's, good is not what God ultimately is pleased with. You know what God's ultimately pleased with? Living for him. That's those who live according to the Spirit. They live to please God. That's their motive, their motive isn't just to do good. Their motive is to say, thank you, Daddy, for your love. Thank you, God, for creating me, for designing me, for the life you've given me. How can I pour out my life in service and love to you? Those who live according to flesh do not belong to Christ. And I know that seems harsh. It's there. I didn't write it. On the opposite side, those who live according to the Spirit do belong to Christ. Those who live according to the flesh, their body is dead because of sin. In other words, when the body is gone, the body is gone. It, is, it, it goes to dust. The soul may live on in separation from God, but the body is gone. But it does say that, that those who are in Christ, their spirit <clears throat> is alive. It's not dead. It's not separated from God because of righteousness. Again, not because of my righteousness. All you have to do is interview my wife and my kids. And though they have some good things to say about me, they can tell you some other things as well. But my righteousness, your righteousness, doesn't lie in ourselves. 
It lies in what Christ did, his righteousness. And therefore, my spirit is alive because the requirement of the law was fulfilled in Christ who is now in me. Who Christ who is now in me. And the result of that is that I will be raised, you will be raised and given a new body just like Christ. We'll be given a new body in the heavenly realms. We won't just be spirit. I don't know how the body will be. I don't know what shape or form or what age. But I, it won't have sin. It won't be marred by sin. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll be pretty incredible. Those who live according to the flesh, their obligation is to the flesh. Their debt is to the flesh. To thine own self be true. Doesn't it sound great? You know what that's saying? Your obligation is to your flesh. Ultimately, you're accountable to nobody. Ultimately, you're accountable to you and what you feel is right and what you want and what makes you happy. And how do we determine all those things? By our flesh. Even, even you say the mind as well is part of the flesh. But those who live according to spirit, their obligation is to God's spirit. It's the Holy Spirit within them. That's who their debt is to. And the result is those who live according to the flesh are sons and daughters of the enemy. And I know, again, that sounds harsh. You just, the only one you have to argue with that went on is Jesus. That's what he says to the folks who follow that. He says, you are sons of the devil. But here it says those who live according to the Spirit are sons and daughters of of God. That's who you are. You've been adopted. You weren't chosen because you were good enough. You were chosen because he was good. He was righteous. And it's through the indwelling of the Spirit that you receive by faith in Christ that we overcome the flesh and we begin to live a fruitful Christian life. We begin to live that life in step. Now I started this with a little video clip of what it looks like to live in step. I didn't fully show you the clip. I wanted to show you the rest of this. Pay attention to the guy in the back. Watch this. So that's what it looks <clears throat> to live in the step with the Holy Spirit. They were in step. They were together. And like I say, as Galatians 5.25, since we live by the Spirit, if you're in Christ, you live, should live by the Spirit. It says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's what the New International Version says, or, or walk with the Spirit. But I like this idea of step with the Spirit, because it kind of shows the exactness. And so in this, this last half, I, I want to really kind of dig down on, on this living in step with the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? Because I think many of us, you know, um, we know, maybe we've learned the basic march that we saw at the very first you know, the, 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 the just kind of keeping in step and it's, you know, church and your Bible. But then when we see this kind of stuff, we're like the guy in the back of the line looking at them in, in sync and in, in, in musical harmony going, what is going on here? This, this is on a whole new level. And that's where God wants us. So let's talk about that. First of all, living in step with the Holy Spirit requires Constant contact. Living in step with the Holy Spirit requires constant contact. Let me, let me kind of give you a, 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 a visual representation of what constant contact looks like. It's like the difference between a motor car and a tram. It's the difference between a motor car and a tram. See, the motor car, the, most of our vehicles actually all of our vehicles, operates on the storage principle, right? You pull up to the gas station or you plug into an outlet and you store up energy 
and it allows you to get from point A to point B. The tram, however, runs on a constant connection and contact principle. It's in constant contact. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. The advantage, obviously, of constant contact is you, know, you don't run out of gas. And as long as you have contact, you keep going. You never have to stop. The advantage of the motor car operating on the storage principle is you can go wherever you want to go. If there's no electricity over there, you can go over there. You go a lot of places. Now, in terms of, of being in contact with the Holy Spirit, I just, I just kind of want, want to follow this out a little bit. Many of us live our Christian lives based on the storage principle. You come to church and you think, you know, you store up grace. You get God's word and it's supposed to last you then for the next six and a half days. It's the only time you think of or you seek or you're in tune with God. You just kind of fill up. And, and why do we do that? I, I, I don't know why you do it. I'll tell you why I want to do it. Because there's things in the rest of my week that I want to get to that God's lines may not go to. I have my agenda. I have my route of how to get from point A to point B. But then A, I run out of gas. B, I often, <clears throat> excuse me, I often find myself in neighborhoods I have no, no clue of where I'm at, and, and even worse, no business being there. But to be in constant contact with the Holy Spirit means to get a constant supply of his power, of his guidance, and to stay on track. Your day kind of may look similar. You may, if you may work on the, the motor car kind of principle, and you get up, and maybe, maybe you spend a little bit of time, you know, you have your, your Max Lucado devotion that morning, or your Beth Moore devotion, or whatever it may be, Oswald Chambers. You get a little, little maybe a little pick-me-up. Yes, or maybe Joel King. <laughs> and, then what, and then what do we do? Well, we, got, we run into our day. We got a job to go to. We got things to kind of kind of get through. And, and for most of us, we do our job unless something goes wrong, and then maybe we'll throw up a flare to God. And not it's usually to ask him what we should do as much as to ask him to do what it is that we need done. And then we come home and there's dinner to make and there's kids to take care of, there's whatever responsibilities you have, things in the house to be done, right? And then you're so exhausted. There's TV to be watched, books to be read, people to talk to, whatever. Maybe then when you go to bed, you say kind of a thank you for this day kind of prayer. And probably a few times throughout the day, if you're really spiritual, right, you pray over your food. That's the storage principle. But to, but to stay in step with the Holy Spirit <clears throat> is like the tram. It's, a, it's constant contact. It's getting up in the morning and not just saying, <clears throat> what does the Bible have to say? Though I, I think that's important. But it's looking at your day and going, God, is there a way I can honor you today? I know I'm meeting with this person and that person. I, I'm, I'm trying for this new, new account. God, A, would you... Give me favor in this new camp, but B, if I can be a light to them, help me be a light. Oh, God, I, thank you for bringing to my mind these three people in our church, and, and I just want to lift them up to you because I know so-and-so is sick, and so-and-so is having trouble with their kid, and so-and-so needs a job. And, and, then, and then you go about your day, but in your day, you're in constant contact with God. When you, when you walk into the office, you're like, God, help me not miss any, anyone who might need a touch today who might need to be, to be encouraged today. To utilize the drive maybe, whether it's to, to maybe listen to a, a tape or a video, or no, you can't listen to a video while you're driving. Don't do that. <laughs> a podcast. It's just con it's constant conversation. It, to me, it always reminds me of, of the movie or the play Fiddler on the Roof when Rip Tevi is going about his milk delivery. He's, all, he's talking to God, making jokes, Sometimes complaining, but at least it's just this conference, it's this constant conversation, this constant, where would you have me go? 
It's daily awareness and pursuit of God and his agenda. The second principle is living in step with the Holy Spirit is about new habits. New habits. So let me give you an example here. In AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, they have a saying that says you can't just have one. The idea is that as soon as you take a drink, this is apple juice, by the way. As soon as you take a drink, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> it's over. You've got to have a second. There's, a, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that there's something in their, in their flesh, both physiologically and mentally, that once you take a drink, the choice is gone from there. And, the, and the, here's the thing. We're, most of us here probably are not alcoholics, but all of us have those items. All us have those, for me, it's in the middle of the evening, around 7 or 8 o'clock. If I eat the wrong thing, I can't just stop at 1. I don't know what it, what it is for you. you know, maybe it's going on the internet and seeing something you shouldn't see, and then you just can't. Whatever it may be, that we, we, there are things in all of our lives. You don't have to be spiritual for this principle to understand this principle. You just have to live. And, and you just can't take one. And so what does an alcoholic have to learn? If they don't have control over the second drink, what do they have to learn? i got to do something before the first drink. That's what I have control over. I don't have control over once I start. I don't have any control. So when do I have control? Before. And so it's all, it's, it begins to be, i got to form new habits. By the way, empowered by God, in step with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's step number one. But what God uses is new habits. First of all, you got to hang out with new friends, right? You can't hang out with your drinking buddies, right? Because they're going to put the first drink in your hand. Second of all, you need new coping mechanisms, Right before, when when life got stressful, or when you celebrated something, or when you were sad about something, it didn't really matter. Whatever it was, you cope with it with a drink in your hand, or with food in your hand, or with pornography, or with anger, or with you fill in the blank. And so you need to look for new coping, making new new habits. When I'm feeling tired, when I'm feeling sad, when I'm feeling distant, rather than whatever my coping mechanism is, I'm going to. Call my Bible study leader. I'm going to read the scripture. I'm going to listen, listen to worship music. I'm going to just talk to God about it. New coping mechanisms. And all that leads to also a new way of thinking. You've got to think differently. And this is why we stress the scripture so much. Because, it, because we, we are, <clears throat> when we come to Christ, we, our minds are renewed with God's truth. God's truth, first of all, that there is no condemnation, but second of all, with God's, God's truth, that we no longer have to live by the flesh, but we live by the Spirit and what is true and what is right and, and other people's stories of, of their successes. New way of thinking. Living in step with the Holy Spirit is about new habits. New habits. And this is important. This next one is important to know in the midst of that. And that living in step with the Holy Spirit is a process. It's a process. It does not happen overnight. For some people, certain aspects do happen overnight. God's grace sometimes works that way. But even if, if there is an aspect like they're no longer tempted to drink or, they're, or all of a sudden um, the anger is gone or whatever that issue is, there's still other issues in their life that need to be developed over time because none of us ever are like Jesus like that. It's a process. I shared this graphic with you uh, uh, last week when we were talking about, about um, being anointed with the Holy Spirit and helping people in their spiritual growth. But obviously, it applies to our spiritual growth as well. Later on, you might want to look this up and, and read it, but in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, Peter actually outlines a process, and, and he begins by saying, add to your faith. And this is really important. You only are good with God through faith in Christ. 
You are only saved, made right, receive righteousness, enter into glory by faith in Christ, period, nothing added. However, if you've done that, Peter says, there's something to do so you don't become unfruitful. You're, you, were, you were adopted into his family. You were made right with God for a reason. And so he talks a little bit about the, the process. He says, add to your faith goodness and knowledge. In our, in our graph, right, somebody uh, who's kneeling to the cross, that's they're putting their faith in Christ. And then the next you'll see is this little stick figure with the, with the red cross on his head or her head. And the first step is just, is just basically growing and knowing what does God require of you? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What does the Scripture say that life should look like, shouldn't look like? And goodness is those things you already know. Right? There, there are things that when you were struggling, that you were living in the flesh, no one needs to tell you when you decide to get your life right, you need to change. You know it. You know that needs to stop. You don't need no Bible. You don't need a sponsor or a Bible study leader. You know it. That's goodness. But then there are other things that you need to grow in. That you, that, you become, that, you, that, you, that you begin to realize, oh man, God's not just concerned about what's on the outside. He's concerned about my inside. He's not just concerned about what I do. He's concerned about my motives. And you grow in knowledge about those things. And as you grow in, in, in knowledge, he says, add to your uh, faith goodness, knowledge, and then self-control, perseverance, and godliness. Self-control is, okay, I know I shouldn't do, I, sh I know I shouldn't take a drink, but that doesn't mean no good just to have the knowledge. At some point, I need to begin to apply some self-control. And again, the self-control is not, is not just having one, in the case of an alcoholic. It's those things that precede the drink. It's those things that precede the drink. Self-control. And then perseverance is simply you continue doing it, right? I have great self-control for about two weeks of every diet I've ever been on. Phenomenal self-control. It's the third week that always trips me up. Perseverance is basically doing self-control over the long haul. And then it says that this leads to godliness. And godliness isn't like you're like Jesus. What godliness is is basically that you're obeying the rules. You may not want to. Your heart may not be changed. But basically, the things that you know that you should do, you're doing. Like, like, like an, a, a workout, right? When you, at, at the beginning, you know, you just go and you faithfully, you self-control, you persevere, you go. And for a long time, you're just doing it because you know you should or your doctor said you should, but you don't feel like it. Well, that would be godliness. You're doing it even though your attitude has not changed yet. And that's why it goes from the head to the feet and the hands, because it's the doing. It's a process. But God's ultimate goal, as he says, add to goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, is brotherly kindness and then love. Brotherly kindness is when our heart begin, our motives now begin to change. And it usually starts within the family of God. That's what it means, that brotherly or sisterly kindness is I begin to love those who are close to me, that I know, that are my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not just something I'm faking anymore. It, it, it's now something or I'm trying to self-discipline myself in. It's something that's authentically coming out of me. And I begin to love my brothers and sisters, but then ultimately, he wants to leave to love where it not only extends to those that I'm close with in the family of Christ, but to the world, a world that's an enmity with God and a world that's an enmity with me. And then you'll notice this is a circle. So that love externally begins to go to those who are far from Christ. And that's where the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes in because we're trying to help them get closer to Christ. But there's also an eternal love inside the circle and that's where God begins to reveal other areas of life that you need to confess and ultimately submit to based on the conviction that he lays on your heart. And it, and it just keeps going. It's a process. It's a process. The next part of living in step with the Holy Spirit is that it's about growth. It's about growth. And simply put, 
The very next verse, and after he says, add to your faith all those qualities, the very next verse says this in 2 Peter, for if these qualities are yours, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, that's what I'm saying, it's a constant circle. We're constantly growing. They keep you from being what? Ineffective and unfruitful unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, there's something more than just your faith that God wants to accomplish in your life. When we adopted our kids out of their, their homes of alcohol and drug abuse, our desire was not just to accept them into the King family, but to give them a better choice, to give them a better life. God unconditionally accepts you, but that doesn't mean he doesn't desire for you to have a fruitful and productive life, a better life than if you'd lived by the flesh. And he doesn't say you need to do this perfectly, but he does say you need to what? Grow increasingly. These qualities increase in your life. That, by the way, is the sign of the Holy Spirit's in your life. Not that you perfectly have joy all the time, that you're faithful all the time. But you know what? If we talk to the people who know you, they could say, yeah, you know what? I've seen joy increase in their life. I've seen forgiveness. I've seen humility. I've seen self-control increase in their life. It's a sign of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's a sign of growth. And lastly, living in step with the Holy Spirit starts now. Starts now. And you cannot do, or you should not do, what I do with my diets. I'm going to start on Monday, so I'm going to go wild on Sunday. There's a wide saying that says this. It says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Is now. The time to have begun to walk in the Spirit seriously as a connect, constantly connected, was as soon as Christ called you. But if you're like me, you kind of, you know, sometimes you ride the tram, and then often you take the car. The second best time is today. The second best time is right now. To walk, that's why we've done this whole series. We believe that this church, this body of believers, these followers of Christ, we would be, we're going to be a radically different church. We're going to be a radically different people if we understand and live by the Holy Spirit that is in us. There is a constant flow of power. And I'm not just talking about phenomenal miracles, though that is part of it. We've talked about that. I'm just talking about power to live your day with purpose and meaning where you're not just running to the store to grab something. It, when you go to the store, you're, you're looking for, is there, is there just some way to bless someone? Maybe it's a smile, maybe it's an encouragement, maybe just noticing that the cashier's having a bad day, or maybe it's sharing Jesus with someone. You don't know, but if you're connected with the Holy Spirit, he'll show you that. And all of a sudden, your life becomes, rather than, than just a religious march, it's got a beat to it. It's got some funk it's got some flow, purpose. And the world begins to look and go, they might go, that's a little weird, but on the other hand, man, there's something different there. First of all, somebody who walks, who, that walks in step with the Spirit, they don't just know about God. You, you cannot live that way and not know God. He's someone you're talking to and relating to, and, he, and you see him show up all the time because you're talking. See, God does miracles every day. We never see it because we're never asking in the first place. Right? It's kind of, kind of like when you finally decide to get a new car and you do all your research and all of a sudden you say, I want this car. And then all of a sudden you notice, man, those cars are everywhere. Were they, weren't they everywhere the day before? Yeah. Why didn't you notice? Because you weren't looking for it. You start looking for God and, and relating to him, you're going to see him and his work everywhere, and you're going to get to know him. And then you'll no longer be trying to remember, you know, the four spiritual laws and the way to lead. All you, all you need to do is when, when it'll just pour out of you. When people talk about your life, you've got to talk about God because everything in your life is seen through that filter. You know him. You don't talk about something that you believe. You talk about someone you know. 
And, and people begin to notice the change in your life. Not only do you love God, but they begin to see, see progress in your life. And by the way, progress is a lot more encouraging for people than perfection. Right? Because when we see perfection, we just go, uh, I can't relate to that. But when we see somebody grow, that they were here and now they're here, that's encouraging to us and attractive to us. How did you do that? What the, how did, I, it's, it's the spirit in me because of Christ. I'm no longer condemned, but I live by what God's in my life. And they begin to see that change. And then the world takes notice. We become a light in the darkness. Not because we have religious answers and because we go to church and we have folks to show up when we need to move. But because we have this relationship with God, this power pouring into our lives, both in purpose as well as at times miracles. And the biggest miracle being a changed life. The biggest miracle being I'm, I'm, this no longer controls my life. The, big, the biggest miracle being the, the forgiveness and the understanding that they see between you and your kids, though you struggle with the same thing and the same thing with teenagers, they, they do, they see this. How did that come about? It's, it's not me. It's not my kids. It's, it's what Jesus has done. It all comes about because we're walking in step with the Holy Spirit. Father God, This is my prayer. This is a pastor's plea for those that you've entrusted to my care. May we walk in step with your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we walk in step with your Holy Spirit. Father, may, may we slowly but surely Learn what it is to be in constant contact with you. That you may show us the new habits for the new life, dear Lord. That we also may rest in the fact that it's a process, dear God, and that the work that you began in us, you will complete, that we begin to see the growth in our lives. And God, give us the wisdom, the self-control to start now. To, to narrow in on walking in step with your Holy Spirit. I pray this in the wonderful name of our Lord who should direct our lives, who we should follow, in the wonderful name of our Savior who became the likeness of flesh and gave his very life to fulfill righteousness on our behalf. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you stand up, I'd like to ask God's blessing as we go out from this place. And, and this is simply uh, what I ask. I just ask, I ask that you are blessed with an overwhelming sense of his presence and the desire to be in step that you may experience something amazing this week as you walk in step with his spirit. Go walk in the dust of our master and step with the Holy Spirit. God bless. We'll see you Friday night at the Harvest Festival.